Welcome to Oliver Travel Trailers. I'm Jason Estry, the service manager, and today we're going to be doing a walkthrough for the Oliver Legacy Elite 2. Here in the front of our campers, you'll notice the front jack, and we want to discuss the operation of the jack. Uh, you have a switch that turns a, a light on for you, so if it's dark, you can see a little bit better. The other switch just operates the jack motion up and down. You press up, and the trailer actually raises up. You press down, trailer goes in the down position. Now keep in mind, when it's on the tow vehicle, uh, it gets a little bit confusing because then you're thinking about the motion of the jack, not the trailer. So when you press the switch up, the jack's actually moving down and vice versa. Now, here on the top of the jack, we have a little bubble. Uh, it's preset at the factory for you, but will require a little bit of adjustment as time goes on. Uh, but you can just kind of press on it. There's a little bubble that bounces around. We're trying to center it inside the circle to make sure the camper is good and level when you set up for camp. The jacks do require a little bit of yearly maintenance. Uh, about once a year, uh, you would either want to perform this yourself or take it in to a service center or schedule with us here in the service department. But the jack head has to come off to lubricate a pin inside, as well as removing this cover in the top of the jack to get in to inspect the gears and the lubrication in the gears as well. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our LP housing. Here in the front of the camper, we have an LP housing. One thing we do is we install a six inch deck port. This is just for easier access so that you can just spin the deck port, removing it and giving you access to the inside of the housing to get to your tanks. You can reach in and turn the LP regulator on uh, one side or the other, uh, turn the tanks on as well. Now, so we can get a better look, I'm gonna go ahead and take this cover off. You've got a latch on each side of the lid. Once those latches are removed, you'll just pick the lid up, slide it off to the side. Now here on the inside, we've got two 30 pound LP tanks. This is an option. Uh, all of them come standard with 20 pound tanks. Uh, if you do a lot of boondocking, I would recommend getting the 30 pound tanks. But here they're attached to a single regulator. It is an automatic switch over. So what you would do is just turn, select whichever tank that you want uh, the regulator to pull from, open that tank. If both tanks are open, the regulator will automatically switch and pull from the secondary tank once the primary tank has been drained. Now, the lever will not move. Uh, that's just a manual operation. The, the automatic feature is built into the inside of that. Now you will notice uh, a little gauge on the front of this regulator. Right now it's red because we've got our tanks turned off. When you turn the tank on and this line is pressurized and the regulator sees that gas, it will go ahead and turn green. So that's an indication that you can utilize to come out, check and see if you've got uh, propane or if you don't. Now granted, um, once you come out and it's red, then you're already out of propane. Now we do have an upgrade option that you can purchase. Uh, it's actually Alpine, uh, LP tank sensors that are mounted to the bottom uh, that basically just gauge the weight of the tank and then will report to your cell phone via Bluetooth. So that way you can actually see as it's depleted. Let's go ahead and set this cover back on. When you set the cover on, you'll notice the bracket mounting at the rear on the body of the camper. We're going to want to slide the LP cover in, but make sure that you do get it to set properly on that bracket. Once it's set on the bracket, then we just simply go ahead and place the latches back into their place. You want to be careful with the deck ports because you can, if you get in a hurry, cross thread which is not a good thing, so just a little bit of patience for that. All right, here on this model, we have the optional 30 amp convenience port. The standard port is on the other side, which we'll take a look at here in a moment. This is just on this side, which can be utilized for a generator. Uh, depending on the campground, you could actually just plug your power cord into this as well. Regardless of which one you use, both of them go inside to a transfer switch and then go in to power the camper. Here on this model, we have our front LP Quick Connect. This is a low pressure system. So whatever components or appliance that you hook to this must be rated 
to, to be used with the low pressure system. The appliance cannot have its own regulator as the propane is already being regulated by the, the one that's on board. You'd simply pull the little plug out, attach the piece, and there is a little locking mechanism. Uh, once it's locked on, then it'll allow the gas to flow into that appliance for you. Storage basket can be used for pretty much anything. Some people place generators in here for transport. We do not recommend running the generator from this basket as it is too close to the actual LP tanks. So when you get to where you're going, you'd want to remove that generator uh, safe distance away from the LP tanks. Some people put chalks and other things, but it's just basically a storage basket for anything that you want to put inside. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the Bulldog coupler in the front. We utilize the Bulldog coupler instead of a standard or traditional uh, coupler. Uh, it comes in from the side instead of the rear, grabs a hold a little bit more of that ball for a better bite. Uh, but otherwise works pretty much exactly like any other coupler does work. Here in the front, uh, we also provide a pin, and I do want to make mention that once you run the seven pin to the tow vehicle, I always like to slide this through and lock the seven pin in with this. Uh, the reason for that is that way it kind of helps to make sure that this cord doesn't drop to the ground and drag. Of course, in the front, uh, you'll notice that we have safety chains. Both chains are rated for the weight of the camper. Hopefully, you'll never have to use these. These are just there for safety purposes. Here we have the safety breakaway, which we hope you never have to use, but it is a precaution. So uh, it's just got a carabiner on one end. You would simply stretch this and attach it to, to the tow vehicle. You'll want to make sure that this does get a hard attachment to the tow vehicle, either at the hitch or some point on the tow vehicle. Do not attach this to your chains because if the chains were to break loose from the camper, uh, we want this still on the tow vehicle so that it yanks the brakes and stops the camper. Now, depending on your tow vehicle, the location of the hitch and what type of hitch you have, as there are several different models out there, you may actually have to add an additional carabiner or something in order to get the run where you need to attach it on the tow vehicle. Here on the street side of the camper, you'll notice that we have the two overhead porch lights and on the lower side, we have the outside courtesy lights. Here towards the front, you'll see the markers, the reflectors, and of course, the bathroom window. Here is some important information for your camper. It's the tire and loading information. It does tell you how much storage capacity your camper has. Each camper is different based on the options that are added as the gross vehicle weight rating is the 7,000 pounds. So based on the build out uh, and the weight of finalization, then you just have the difference between it and the 7,000. This particular one is 1,650 pounds that's allowed as storage capacity. Here you also have the VIN sticker uh, if you ever need to, to determine your VIN or the date that it was produced. If we go underneath, you'll see a Sani T flush port. Now this port here is to flush out the black tank. Uh, if you've got a compost toilet, then you'll probably never utilize this. But with the standard toilet, every once in a while you'll want to hook up a, a hose. I don't recommend using the same hose that you use for your city water or fresh water inlet, but you'd want a secondary hose that you can hook to this port. And this line actually runs all the way up and under the vanity inside the bathroom. It actually runs inside the camper and hits a check valve uh, or vacuum brake before going down into the black tank, just to make sure that none of the stuff in the black tank can come back the other direction. Uh, but once it goes through there, it'll hit a little jet on the side of the tank to help rinse that tank out for you. All right, here is the standard 30 amp connection. Every camper will receive one of these. Uh, the operation, and they work the same in the front and the rear, you just spin it one direction, pull it open, and then attach your power cord. Now the power cord, uh, and it depends on the style that you have, we do provide one here. Um, you would just plug it in, rotate it, and you will want to make sure that you tighten it on. The tighter the connection, the better, as a loose connection can result in heat buildup, and that heat buildup can result in, in this getting too hot and actually melting. Um, so make sure that you attach this properly. 
When not in use, you just simply close it, spin it back tight. Here we have our battery box. Now it does have a compression latch. This compression latch is lock style, so you will have a key to lock and unlock this. Once you open it up, you have access to the battery tray and batteries inside. We'll pull both latches, slide the tray forward, exposing our batteries. Now this particular model has the 130 amp hour Lithionics lithium batteries. You get three of these if you purchase this option, which is the Lithium Pro package. Um, and that would result in 390 amp hours. Uh, if you're a boondocker or like to, to travel where you're not going to have power, then this is definitely a good package to, to get. We're going to take a look at the Lithionics 315 amp hour batteries today. Now this option uh, is available on the Oliver Legacy Elite 2 only. Uh, these batteries are too large to fit in the uh, smaller Elite. Now you do get two batteries. Each battery is 315 amp hours, which gives you a total 630. With the lithium battery, you have the availability to use up to 100% uh, of the charge state. Uh, it's a little different from uh, like an AGM or standard 12 volt where you roughly get about 50% before it drops below 12 volts. With the Lithionix lithium batteries, you can actually utilize up to 90% uh, of the battery's charge. Uh, at 12 volts or higher, uh, it'll at that point it'll actually power off and, and reserve that last 10%. Uh, you can of course choose to go ahead and turn the battery back on and utilize the last 10% of the battery charge. That last bit will be below 12 volts, uh, and I believe it's 10 and a half to 11.9 volts in that last 10% state. Now with this particular Lithionics battery, the 315 amp has an internal heat mat. Uh, it's gonna control that when it needs to, so you don't have to worry about being out in the cold uh, and being able to charge these batteries. All that's gonna function inside with the battery management system. Again, the cold temperature cutoff is below the 32 degrees for charging the batteries, and the cutoff is below zero degrees for discharge. Now looking at the top, you'll see the two little blue uh, LED rings. Uh, that indicates that these batteries are turned on. Sometimes you'll notice that they're flashing, uh, which will tell you that they're being charged. Um, now, as far as charging these batteries, that's it's a lot of power. Uh, so your solar, if you get the solar package with this, uh, it's going to charge at a much slower rate than what you're capable of using out of this battery, which means you will have to manage that, uh, that use a little bit. Now with a standard generator or your shore power connection, you're going to be charging the 12 volt batteries at 120 volts going into the charger, which will then uh, push the appropriate amount of voltage, uh, roughly 14.4 volts uh, in bulk charge and absorption uh, modes. Uh, in the bulk charge rate, it's going to push quite a bit of amperage into the batteries to bring it up as quick as possible. However, that is controlled within the settings of the charger. The settings can be changed inside the charger, but we typically set it for 150 amps per hour, uh, reaching full charge state as quickly as four hours. Uh, once it goes from the bulk charge state into the absorption mode, uh, it's gonna start to slow down the amount of amps going into the batteries uh, and a full charge cycle for batteries through bulk charge absorption and the float, float mode is uh, kind of like a trickle charge, uh, maintaining the battery at the top end level of it. Uh, it. It can take several hours, the bulk charge rate itself being five to six. During bulk charge, when the uh, charger is set to 150 amps per hour, uh, you can reach full charge in as quickly as four hours. Now with these batteries, because they don't operate the same as a standard 12 volt or AGM battery, Instead of looking at the voltage display inside the camper, you will want to download and monitor these batteries utilizing the Lithionics battery app. That battery app is going to show you the true state of charge in the battery uh, based on percentages. So that way you can see where the battery percent is. Uh, once it gets down below 50%, you, you'll definitely want to start uh, watching what you're using uh, and keep in mind that you may want to, to get a charge. 
Now, if you're hooked up to shore power, uh, it's it's not going to be an issue. They could should continue staying in in a charge rate and keeping it in float, uh, maintaining the voltage and the amperage inside. Uh, it's just when you're boondocking or not hooked to shore power where you're utilizing that 12 volt battery power uh, that you definitely want to keep an eye on it. Uh, now let's uh, talk about storage. Uh, storage on any lithium battery, typically what they recommend is to discharge the battery to about 50% and then you'd want to turn the battery off. There is a 12 volt breaker inside the camper, however, um, it does not disconnect all of the loads. Uh, also keep in mind that weather conditions do also impact the discharge of a battery, even if it's not connected and just sitting on a shelf. Um, as it's sitting there for at 50% state of charge, you will want to actually go and check on it occasionally. And if it's in storage longer than six months, you would want to go back out, fully charge it, uh, and then discharge back down to 50 before it could be stored again for up to another six months. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Lithionics battery app. Now you will need to download this and uh, we will definitely give you some instructions on how to download it from the uh, Google store uh, or the iTunes app store. Uh, once you have it, you would just simply click the app. Once it pulls up, it's going to Bluetooth connect to any battery in the vicinity. So you will need to make sure that you get the number of your battery. Uh, the number of your battery is located on the top of the battery itself. Uh, and you would just find that number and then locate it uh, on the phone. Once you locate it on the phone, you'll select each battery. Now this goes into each individual battery itself. It does not look at this as a, a battery bank. Uh, but once you're inside, you can take a look. It shows you what the current voltage is. If there's any current, either um, a load is going to show as a red number, uh, which means you are drawing from the batteries. Anything showing in green is going to show that the batteries are charged. Now, this particular one's at 100% right now, so there's no real charge state and there's no load coming on the battery. Uh, we can also see the battery temperature in here uh, and how, how much time we have left roughly. Um, with the current state of the battery and the current load. Uh, you can also see any status codes uh, if something's going on and of course the state of the battery is on. You can scroll to the next screen, get a little bit more information broken down in a table view. You can actually see each individual cell uh, inside the app itself. So you can see each cell and what the voltage is in that. Uh, once you've checked one, uh, roughly both batteries should look the same. However, you can choose the other, uh, go into it and take a look at what that battery shows. Uh, this one roughly is the same. We see roughly the same voltage, no current draw right now, uh, and the battery temperature is fairly the same between the, the two of them. Uh, once you're done, you can just simply uh, close the app. Now, I would like to tell you, once you log into this battery on this device, if you have more than one uh, device, a uh, um, tablet and a phone, this device is currently locked. A tablet will not be able to even see this battery to log into it until I get completely out of it and disconnect from the app, uh, which would actually have to be closed completely out. We're going to take a look at the uh, six volt AGM batteries that uh, are offered in the Legacy Elite 2. Um, it's six volt, 220 amp hour battery. Uh, so with the four batteries, you basically increase the six volts to 12 uh, and you double the amp hours. Effectively, you only have 220 amp hours to utilize because you can only utilize about 50% uh, with a 12 volt battery. Uh, as you use it, you will be able to actually monitor the voltage and see the voltage start to drop uh, as you load up the batteries uh, and continue to, to use it. Now, with a 12 volt battery, when you turn a load on, you may see the voltage immediately drop, and that's because the load has hit the battery. Uh, so you might say the battery is showing uh, 13 volts, so you turn something on and it immediately drops to 12.7. You haven't lost that voltage. Uh, that's just the load hitting the battery. If you were to turn that load right back off, 
you'd see your voltage come back into the battery. However, over a period of time utilizing with that type of load, which is a large load, uh, it would use quite a bit of power. So you do have to keep in mind to, to manage and monitor the, the battery use uh, when boondocking and not connected to a generator or shore power connection. Now with the AGM batteries, uh, they are called maintenance free. You don't have to do anything to them uh, other than charge them. Uh, and of course, certain, certain things have to be done when putting them in storage. Uh, typical AGM battery life is about three to five years. Um, depending on how much time you put into the battery depends on the life of the battery. I'd say I see more last at the three year mark than the five, simply because um, the improper storage or improper charging of the battery. These batteries are designed uh, to be a d deep cycle battery. Uh, they're really designed for something kind of like a golf cart where you'd use it, use it, use it until it gets low and then recharge it. If you get this style of battery and you constantly keep it on a charge at the top end, that's going to shorten the life of the battery. It actually wants to be used. It wants to be discharged. When storing this type of battery, uh, the recommendation is actually to discharge it down to about 70%, which is going to be somewhere around uh, 12 and a half volts. Uh, and then after a period of time, go back, charge it back up, uh, and then let it drop back down, discharge it to, to 70% again. Now that takes, uh, takes some time that you have to dedicate while it's in storage and not everybody can. If you don't follow that and you do put like a trickle charger or just hook it up, um, the biggest thing is, is you're going to be impacting the life of the battery. Um, and that, that just may be easier, however, for you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Just understand you may have to replace your batteries more closer to the three-year mark than the five. Once you press the tray back in, you do want to make sure that it is seated properly and both latches are secure. Once you've made sure they're secure, you can simply close the door. Now with this latch, it only closes one way. So you'll want to make sure that it closes the way and pulls tight to keep it secure. If you try to close it the other way, it'll just pop open. Here on this model, we have the optional uh, solar port. Now if you purchase the solar package, the port does come with that. However, you can get just the port if you choose to through a dealer option. But this solar port runs directly inside and attached to the batteries. So it does not have its own charge controller. This should be utilized when you're wanting to utilize a portable solar system. And that portable solar system needs to have its own charge controller. Now you can use both the roof mounted uh, port or uh, solar panels as well as the portable. Um, and both together will help to, to recharge those batteries. If you do quite a bit of boondocking, then I definitely recommend uh, utilizing the roof and a portable. Um, the other great thing about the portable is if you're parked under some trees, uh, you can move that portable around as the sun changes its angles throughout the day to soak up as much sun as possible. All right, here we have Cooper Discoverer tires uh, and our aluminum wheels uh, with our signature logo on the wheels here as well. Now with the Cooper tires, uh, we do now recommend 55 PSI. So if you already have one of our campers, you may want to go ahead and adjust it to 55 PSI. But uh, moving forward, every camper that leaves our production facility uh, through our dealership will receive 55 PSI for a, a, the best ride possible. If you look in between the tires, you'll notice our Dexter Easy Flex, which is standard with every camper, uh, at least the dual axle campers. The Dexter Easy Flex uh, comes with uh, grease points. Now you'll have eight Zerks each side and they do have to be um, lubricated about every three months, 3,000 miles. Uh, it's not that complicated. You'll just want to get a grease gun that's got a flexible hose so that you can get in there to it. I'm going to take a look at the uh, new Never Lube axles on the 2022 Oliver Legacy Elite 2. The big difference for that model is we went to the Never Lube versus the, the 12 month, 12,000 mile repacking uh, of the bearings. So this is a sealed hub system. There's no reason for that yearly maintenance. Uh, both models do come with a five year, 100,000 mile limited warranty through Dexter Axle. Uh, on the Oliver Legacy Elite 2, however, it was a large change because not only do you get the Never Lube uh, 
um, and no longer have to do the yearly uh, maintenance, uh, you actually go from a 10 inch brake now to a 12 inch brake and a much uh, larger shaft axle uh, underneath the ca uh, camper, much beefier system. Now with this upgrade, uh, it is something that is available on older models. So you can contact the service department uh, and schedule a time to bring um, your current Oliver in and upgrade to the new Never Lube axles. Uh, the best time to do that is when it's time for your yearly maintenance so you're not paying for the repack and you're just jumping straight into the Never Lube axle, uh, going up to a much beefier axle, a larger brake, and then no longer having to worry about that yearly maintenance on the axles. Here towards the rear of our camper, you'll have a satellite and a cable connection. Now the difference in this is the cable uh, will run straight through into the TV. If you hook to this at a campground, you'll just have to go inside, pull the TV up, go into the menu settings and do a cable search. With the satellite, this would be utilized if you are um, got a portable satellite. You'll connect to here. However, this is a straight run and will need to be attached to the satellite receiver inside. Um, and of course that would require a direct TV dish network um, subscription to go with that. If we take a look down below, you'll see our fresh water inlet on the left and our city water fill on the right. Now the difference is the fresh tank fill does one thing. It simply puts water to the onboard fresh tank inside the camper. Um, you fill it, once you're done you disconnect the hose and you would have to utilize the onboard water pump in order uh, to pump that water up into the faucets. With the city you can connect the water hose, leave it connected, it'll pressurize all the plumbing lines inside, and then it's, it's ready to go whenever you wanna use the faucets. The only time you do not ever want to leave the hose connected is if the outside temperatures are below freezing, as it would freeze that water hose. Um, typically, if that occurs, it doesn't do any damage inside the camper, um, but of course, we don't wanna risk that or chance it. Here, you'll notice a little white pipe hanging down this is simply a drain tube for the air conditioner. Uh, as you run your AC, it actually pulls moisture from inside the camper and it's supposed to drain down this tube. Now in extreme high humidity situations, you may still notice that some of that moisture rolls down the side of the camper uh, as, as it'll overcome that, that system uh, and has to go somewhere. Here we have our outside storage area. Uh, we like to call it our basement. Uh, has the same style compression latch as the battery box and it is lockable. Uh, once it's unlocked, you just simply open the door. Behind the door, you'll expose the basement area, the rear jack switches, your street side and your curb side. Of course, here at the rear for your rear jacks, I do want to point out that these are stabilization jacks only. They should never be used to level the camper. Uh, if you're in a situation where you have to level the camper, we do recommend that you use either some of the curved leveling blocks uh, or just any, any type of block, even a piece of wood if you have to, and drive the camper up on that on the side that needs to be lifted uh, to level the camper out, and then place these on the ground just to help stabilize so that when you're inside, you don't have that rocking motion. Your outside shower. Now with the outside shower, I do wanna mention, once you've got this on, you press this in order for the water to flow. However, these controls the mixing of the hot and the cold. When you are finished with this, I highly recommend that you turn these knobs to the off position. If you don't um, and you leave one going, that pressure can actually backfeed into one of the other lines and create um, an issue where you may not be getting the hot water inside the camper that you would like to have. Here below the shower, we have our black drain and our gray drain. Now, if you have the compost toilet, you'll never use this. But otherwise, what you'd want to do once you hook up to drain your waste tanks, Pull the black first, uh, allow it to drain out, and then pull the gray uh, and allow it to kind of help rinse out uh, some of the rem uh, remains of, of what may still be in there from the black. Now, when you do drain these, you will want to go inside and open the backflow preventer. Um, by opening that backflow preventer, it releases pressure inside the tank so that everything drains properly. If you accidentally leave the backflow preventer closed, you can get the tank to where it air locks. Uh, it may appear that everything has drained out of the tanks, but it hasn't. It's become airlocked and it's remaining in the tanks um, 
but if something like that happens, just hook back up, pull that backflow preventer, and everything should come out the back like it's supposed to. Now here inside the basement, we do have a light. It's located up here, and you just kind of have to reach in and feel for the switch. You can turn the light on. I want to go over a few things that we provide actually standard with the camper. Uh, one, uh, pressure regulator for the water. We want to make sure that you don't have high water pressure going inside the camper. Uh, if you do, it could cause something to where the uh, relief valve on the water heater was to open up, spray water out the other side of the camper. So you always want to make sure that you have this on the city inlet. It's not really necessary for the fresh tank uh, since it's just dumping into a tank and not really pressurizing anything. Here we provide quick connect hose connectors. Some people love these, some people don't like them at all. We do provide them and you can use them um, if you like those. Every camper does come with a lug wrench. Um, this is for emergency situations. However, I do highly recommend that you get a torque wrench and socket yourself uh, as the wheels are pre-torqued to 120 foot-pounds from the factory. Uh, but because they're aluminum, do require uh, retorquing on certain occasions. Uh, so you may want to look into getting a torque wrench uh, so that you can, can do that while you're on the road. We also provide a power cord with every camper. This is a 25 foot power cord, 30 amp. Now with that power cord, uh, if you are needing an extension, I do recommend purchasing uh, an actual uh, 30 amp extension cord. Uh, if, if you go to Walmart and buy just a basic extension cord, uh, what's potentially going to happen is voltage loss into the camper. Uh, voltage loss occurs, it may not run certain things, or you may actually get heat build up and, and create uh, kind of like a meltdown situation at, at one of those connections. Here we have a manual jack crank just in case uh, one of the jacks fell or a fuse blows. Um, you can actually get into the head of that jack and then you just manually crank it. Uh, we can actually go over that a little later as well. And here is the standard water hose that comes with the camper. Um, you can use this for your fresh water um, or again if you have a black tank and you want to utilize this for the black tank uh, to rinse it out and then get a secondary hose to use for your fresh fill. Uh, we do have additional hoses for sale in the service department. If you get the LP Quick Connect option, uh, you will also receive uh, the little mail couplers uh, for use with that. Now we do just provide the couplers. You would have to, to have your own LP hose uh, or purchase one through the service department if you have an appliance that you're wanting to, to utilize for that low pressure system. All right. We also provide uh, the first waste hose. It is a 20 foot waste hose. Um, and this should be everything that you ever need. You may at times at certain campgrounds find that you need an extension. Uh, and over time you may end up wanting to get a different one. Um, but we do provide a 20 foot revolution hose. All right. That should be everything inside the, the basement. Uh, of course, once you're done utilizing the basement, just turn the light off. Close the door, snap the compression latch in place. One of the options that we have is a rear camera. It's mounted here on the rear above the Oliver lens. Uh, the current brand that we're using is a Furion camera system. Uh, it's actually been great. We've actually had one we've been testing since 2017. Uh, of course, it'll come with a display that you can either uh, place inside the tow vehicle and use while you're driving. Uh, some people like to actually bring it back inside the camper with them and use it as like a little security camera uh, on the rear of the camper. Below that, of course, you'll see our, our signature Oliver lens. Now that lens is tied to the marker lights. So the four, five little uh, red marker lights there, uh, when they're lit up, that Oliver light should be lit up as well. Now, if you look here towards the bottom, you'll see our optional receiver hitch. Now, this receiver hitch is a one and a quarter hitch. Uh, you'll want to make sure that whatever accessory you purchase is for a one and a quarter. Uh, the way this center hole is uh, drilled out, an adapter will not fit. Um, 
So, so it would need to be a one and a quarter accessory for that. Now to remove this hitch, if you ever need to get to the spare tire, there's four pins, two on both sides. Let's go ahead and remove these pins so I can show you how to remove the hitch. Once the four pins have been removed, you just want to grab a hold of the hitch and shimmy it out. And just set it off to the side. Now that gives us access to the spare tire cover. We're going to lower the license plate. Spin this out of the way. Now there is a washer behind this and you do want to try to make sure that you catch it so that it doesn't go rolling across the ground. Once you have the washer removed, you can simply slide the spare tire cover off. Because of the license plate light, we do have a wire that has a quick disconnect feature. You simply pull those apart, and that way you can set this off to the side as well. Now that we have access to our spare tire, we'll simply want to remove this piece that holds it secure and in place. Now we should be able to pull the spare tire off of its mount and slide the wire right through. Of course, before you install your spare tire, you may want to double check uh, the tire pressure. The tire pressure in the spare should be left around 80 PSI. That's the max. And the reason for this is it may be one year, two years, three years, five years before you ever need the spare. Um, that way the max air, as air does, over time leak out through the sidewall of a tire. Uh, of course, this one is pre-filled with nitrogen um, and it doesn't seep quite as fast. However, I would rather have a tire that was overfilled to let air out versus one that was underinflated and not have the ability to put more air into it. Once you're done with this, you'd simply want to put it back on the camper. Now you do want to run this wire back through Notice that the tire is facing where the wheel front side goes to the inside back of the camper, and that's the proper way to mount it. Once we have it back on, we'll just put its piece in here to secure it. Make sure it's good and secure. Now we can simply place the cover back in place. All right. Before we put the cover back on, we will want to go ahead and reattach our license plate light. Once that's in place, just kind of rest the cover on the rear bumper system. We're going to need to try to line it up as close as we can. And then you'll actually have to drop the license plate down so that you can see through the hole to make sure that we get the thread through. Once we have it back in place, you'll want to place the washer first. And now that the spare tire is uh, back in place uh, and the cover, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our uh, bumper system before we uh, reinstall our receiver hitch. On our rear bumper, uh, there's a pin, one on each side. To remove the pin, you do just kind of have to apply a little bit of pressure on the bumper and that'll remove the weight from the pin. Once you do, you slide the pin out. Once both pins have been removed, the bumper should slide down in the open position. Here inside our bumper system, on the street side is the waste pipe. Now you'll want to connect that waste hose, and we've actually designed this where you can just slide the waste hose back here and keep it stored separate from everything else. 
This is not a dry storage system, but it works perfect for the waste hose. Now here on the other side, we do have another rear LP quick connect. This is an optional feature, uh, so you would have to ask for this. It works the same as the one on the front of the camper as well. Of course, once you're done uh, dumping or doing whatever you need to here in the, the rear bumper area, you'd simply fold the bumper up and place the pins back into place. To reinstall the bike receiver hitch, you just line everything up and just take your time to slowly press it in. Once you have it back in place and lined up, you just want to reinstall all four pins. Now with this rear receiver hitch, I did want to point out that it was designed for use with a bike rack only. You should never hook another trailer behind it uh, or even a basket. Um, it was just designed and tested for the use with a bike rack. Here at the rear curb side of the camper, you'll notice uh, another water inlet port. Now we've always called this port the boondock port, but uh, in reality, it, it's probably better enough would better be called a service port because it has many, many functions to it. Uh, one of the functions is boondocking. So if you're boondocking and you've already utilized all of your onboard fresh water, you can set a five gallon jug, uh, about a short two foot hose uh, into the bottom of that jug, go inside, configure your water pump, and then have it pull that water back into the fresh water tank that's on board. So for boondocking purposes, that, that's a great feature. Uh, the other function that it serves is actually pulling in uh, antifreeze during winterization process. You simply configure the water pump and that's going to deliver uh, whatever the liquid is here straight to all the faucets. You can also use it to decalcify your plumbing system. Uh, decalcifying is necessary because a lot of the, the United States different areas have hard water. That hard water is going to cause calcium buildup inside the, the plumbing lines and at the faucets and you'll slowly start to see your pressure inside your faucets go away. I've actually seen it build up so badly that it stops all water flow. Uh, you can simply for that take a, a about two, three gallon jugs of distilled white vinegar, uh, use that antifreeze uh, section on the water pump and have it pulled and delivered to the faucets to, to clean all of that out. Uh, the other thing uh, that you would use in this would be the boondock feature to pull in a bleach water solution and that would be to sanitize the system. The big thing to keep in mind is never sanitize with bleach and used vinegar at the same time. Those two chemicals should never be mixed. Here on the curb side of our camper, uh, first I want to point out uh, the Gerard awning on the top. Every camper does come standard with an awning on the curb side. You can upgrade and get an additional awning on the street side, but they do come standard with the curb side awning. Of course, below that you'll also see our top level porch lights and at the bottom uh, more outside courtesy lights. Now let's go ahead and talk about our rear furnace here. Here at the rear of the camper, we actually have our furnace. Now this furnace uh, is a 20,000 BTU uh, furnace uh, and it runs in several different vents uh, located inside the camper. This outside door is only for servicing, either performing the yearly maintenance on it uh, or for a service repair if necessary. Next to it, we have our Truma water heater. Now the Truma is an optional upgrade. We do come standard with the uh, Suburban six gallon water heater. Uh, this is what you call the on-demand. The on-demand, you can open the door here, get to the inside. Here on the outside, you have a power switch, and you may notice that the up position says on, the down position says on, and the off in the center. Uh, this is because Truma is upgraded with an inside switch, so you can either turn it on top or bottom and then control it from that inside switch. The only time that this will change the functionality uh, is if the inside switch were to fail. If the inside switch were to fail, then the top position becomes eco mode, the bottom position becomes comfort mode. And the difference between those is eco mode maintains the water in this little mixing vessel at 42 degrees uh, to ensure that it does not freeze. Now, when you turn the faucet on, it'll immediately kick the burners in and heat that water up to about 125 degrees to deliver to the faucets. In comfort mode, 
it maintains the temperature in this mixing vessel at 102 degrees. Uh, what that simply means is when you turn the faucet on, you get to that 125 degree temperature water a little bit faster, uh, usually about 10 seconds. Here on the outside here at the Truma, uh, the yellow lever here, um, you would press up and open this in order to drain the water. When you press this lever down, it'll open up. Now typically, when this is full of water, before you open it, you'll definitely want to go inside, make sure all your incoming water uh, connection power sources or water sources are cut off. Go inside and open the hot water faucet. That's going to relieve the pressure. Uh, if pressure remains on this and you were to open it, it'd explode that water everywhere. So definitely go inside and relieve the pressure before lowering this lever. Now here is the standard uh, little screen filter that comes with it. Uh, you can upgrade to the uh, what they call the Truma antifreeze kit that allows 12 volt power through this. Uh, so while driving in freezing temperatures, you can turn it to winterization mode, leave water in the Truma, and it'll make sure that it doesn't freeze. You will, however, want to remain uh, or hold on to this. You'll want to keep it as this will be utilized for the decalcification process for the Truma. Um, some people do ask to run vinegar through this, and I do not recommend it as Truma uh, has their own special decalcification tablets. Uh, you can buy them in a, in a pack. Uh, I think they run about $20 for a pack. You just drop them in the end tube here, uh, place it back in, and run through the decalcification process in the manual. Uh, when you're using it, of course, you will want this in place. That way it maintains, holds the water inside. When you winterize, you definitely want to remove this little filter. Uh, if you drain it and put this filter back in, you will have it freeze and it will damage the mixing vessel. So when not in use, we usually recommend to just stick this right over here out of the way. And that way, it's there when you need it. Here on the curbside, you also have an outside receptacle. It's 120 volt power. Uh, it's got the little waterproof cover on it. Now this outlet, like all the outlets in the, the camper, are tied to a single GFCI. Uh, so if something happens and it, it uh, kicks, this isn't working, that would be the first location I would check. Now let's go ahead and look down below here. Uh, you have your rear jack here. And I did want to point out the jack points. You have four jack points on the camper. Um, one in the front and rear on each side. Uh, what this does is if in a situation where you have a blowout or some reason that you have to, to raise the camper up, this would be the point to where you'd want to place your jacks or your jack stands uh, in order to, to help support the camper while you're performing any kind of work. Now, if you have a blowout on the dual axle, you can actually get um, an Anderson feature. It's not something that comes standard with the camper, uh, but we do have them for sale in the service department. And it allows you with the good tire to simply place it, drive up onto it. And when you drive up onto it, it raises this side of the camper. Uh, and it's actually very simple uh, and very safe to, to utilize. Here on the curbside, I do want to just look at the Dexter Easy Flex again. Uh, we do have eight Zerks on this side as well, uh, same as the other. Uh, these would require servicing every three months or 3,000 miles, whichever comes first. Uh, the grease that we actually utilize from the factory is a Sitco Mystique high temperature grease. Uh, so that would be the one that I would recommend going ahead and continuing with. Here on the curbside, we have an upper and lower refrigerator vent. Now, I do want to go ahead and remove these just so that you can see behind. On the upper vent, this is where the hot air is going to vent out. You'll see our baffling system uh, that just helps force that air out the top vent. If you ever remove these, make sure that you do replace them on correctly. There are little slots here on the bottom uh, that needs to be set first. If you don't get those in there properly, this vent will come flying off down the road. Uh, once I put one on, I always like to pull on the top, pull on the bottom, make sure that it doesn't pull loose from the side of the camper. Here on the bottom, it removes the same way. You just simply turn the clips to the release position and pull the vent off. Now, this one is a little bit more important for service uh, purposes. Uh, there is yearly maintenance required on the refrigerator. Uh, that either we can perform or you can take it to another uh, service center. Uh, in here, you've got your gas connections, your 12 volt connections. Uh, of course, here's your cooling unit and that's what we're trying to actually cool. Cooler air will pass through here and go up and as that hot air comes out the top. 
Below the vent, uh, we do have a little clear drain tube for that refrigerator. So some of the moisture in the fridge will drain out here. And it's hard to see, but right here in front of this tire is an overflow drain. That overflow drain is for the fresh tank. So if you hook the water hose up, uh, filling that onboard fresh tank and you forget to, to cut it off in time, it'll start dumping out right here in front of this tire. Here we have our entry door. Uh, we do have a grab handle on the left side of the door to help get inside. Uh, this here is an RV lock keyless entry. It is an optional upgrade that you can get. Uh, and it's a push button lock to lock and unlock the deadbolt. Uh, of course, it does come with keys as well. And I do recommend keeping an extra set tucked away somewhere um, just in case the batteries were to run out. That way you can get in. It does have an alarm on it that will start to alert you as those batteries uh, start to go out. Uh, but we do sometimes tend to ne neglect that. So I always recommend everybody keep a set of keys uh, somewhere in the tow vehicle. Now here uh, on the side of the door, you'll notice a little bumper, this bumper. So when you open it, it doesn't damage the door uh, as you, you press it against the side of the camper. And here we have a hold open uh, hook or, or hoop and hook system. So let's go ahead and open this door up. So you just pull the hook loose pull the door back and secure the door. Now the door will remain secure. Just keep in mind, you don't want to pull on the door and try to slam the door while it's hooked. Otherwise it will damage some of this hardware. Here we have the screen door that does come with uh, the entry door. Uh, you have the little slide here so that you can get to, to the main uh, entry door, open and close it while you're inside the camper. Uh, now, of course, if you want to utilize the screen by itself, leave the, the main door open, you can close this. And of course this slides closed so that way you've got a nice screened uh, door to utilize, L allow some fresh air in. And then once you open this, this will just secure itself back to the main entry door. Our stairs are made out of the same aircraft grade aluminum that the frame is made out of. They're extremely heavy duty. To get these out, you will want to use two hands to slide them out and then fold the bottom step down into place. They are very heavy duty and attached well. And then to, to reinstall them, you just simply fold the bottom step up, use two hands, slide them right back into place. Let's go ahead and step inside the camper so we can see the real magic. We'll go ahead and turn our main cabin lights on. And once we flip this switch up, you'll notice the little blue LED showing that this light switch is getting power. Now, in the newer models, we have a master light switch. So we could sit here and turn all, all of these lights on. And then once we get ready to go, we can actually flip the master. Now, once I flip the master, you'll notice that some of them automatically lost power and some continue to stay on. The ones that remain on are your cell Wi-Fi amplifier, your rear camera, because you'll definitely want the power to the rear camera while you're driving, your street awning and curb awning. You will most likely want to go ahead and just turn those off. Uh, I would uh, recommend only having the awning power on when you're intending to use the awnings. Um, cell Wi-Fi, it's up to you. Uh, the cell booster will not reach the main uh, or the tow vehicle. Uh, in fact, once you walk outside the door here, you're pretty much going to lose your cell uh, and Wi-Fi amplifier. So you could turn that off as well. Let's go ahead and turn our lights back on so we can step inside and see a little bit more of the inside of our camper. Here inside the entry door, uh, we also have the closet. Now here on the closet, you'll also notice that we have a fire extinguisher. Uh, which we hope you never have to use, but there, uh, it's there just in case. Now to get inside the closet, it has the same compression style latches of the basement and the battery door. The only difference here is this does not lock. Uh, you just simply pull it out and then twist to open. Here inside the closet, uh, you'll notice that we have two shelves and a hanging rod. Uh, the hanging rod, of course, uh, for your clothes, Now, if you take a closer look inside the camper, you will notice a, a black pipe. 
that black pipe is the plumbing pipe that releases air uh, or exhaust out the top of the camper. Uh, and you'll also see a little switch for our auto drain feature. It is optional. Uh, it's an upgrade from the standard backflow preventer. Uh, and you'd simply press a button and it's an automatic uh, valve gate that opens and closes. The auto drain feature, it's currently in the closed uh, position. To open, you'd simply press the switch and you'll notice the light starts to flash. The light will remain flashing as long as that gate valve remains open. Uh, the open position should only be used when you are camping and utilizing your plumbing system. Before you pack up and start to drive off, as you're driving down the road, you will want this closed. So you would simply come back in here and press it until the light goes off. Now, if you end up upgrading and getting the additional street side awning, you'll have two power switches uh, and then you'll upgrade to a different remote. Um, that wall switch remote uh, will actually control both awnings. Uh, you'll just select channel one for the curbside, channel two uh, for the street side awning and then use the same buttons on the, uh, the remote to, to function both of those. The Gerard wall switch, also just a little uh, portable remote that you can carry around or you can mount it. Uh, this one is for the use of dual awnings. In the 2022 models, we're actually gonna have the Power Pro as standard curbside only. Now this feature is used with dual awnings as it has the channel feature. So you can select channel one for the curbside, channel two for the street side. If we take a look at the standard remote, it pretty much looks the same. Uh, you just don't have your channel buttons because you're only controlling one awning. Here on our bathroom door, we do have a little latch. If you turn it, this locks the door. I do recommend that while traveling, you always leave this in the lock position so that it is properly secured. Uh, if you have it in the unlock position, uh, then the magnet is the only thing holding it. Uh, hitting bumps, it may cause the door to pop loose. Uh, of course, once the door is unlocked, we want to go ahead and take a step inside the bathroom. Here in the bathroom, uh, if you want to look towards the bottom of our vanity, you'll notice an in inside courtesy light. Now that courtesy light is located here, as well as one outside by the dinette, in case you have to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, the switch uh, we'll look at a little later, but it's located next to the bed area. Uh, looking in the bathroom, uh, of course we have a faucet, works just like any other faucet. Uh, it has two modes, uh, you use it in the sink mode, or we can go ahead and grab this. Pull it into the shower mode and attach it there on the wall. Now on the head, uh, it has two little uh, switches, one for standard faucet and one for shower. Now here in the bathroom, inside the little uh, washcloth or towel rod vanity area, there is a switch. The switch is located up and under here. That is for the water pump. Uh, that's in case you jump in here, get ready to use the water, and you forgot to turn the water pump on. Now the water pump is only utilized for the onboard fresh water tank. If you're hooked to city water, then you're pressurized from the city water and there's no need to turn the water pump on. Uh, of course, you'll also want to make sure if utilizing the water pump that you do have water in the tank as you do not want to run that water pump dry. Here inside the bath, we do have a bath fan. Now to open it, you simply push up and then you'll have a little switch that you press to turn the fan on. When not in use, you'll go ahead and pull that lid down to close it. That is not a rainproof lid, so if it's raining, water can get in, and you definitely want to make sure that that is closed while traveling. Now, if you look over here, this particular model has a compost toilet. The compost toilet is not uh, a standard feature. It is optional, uh, an upgrade. Now, with this, uh, it runs a hose over through the vanity, ties into the exhaust plumbing uh, with the little fan. Uh, you do get a spray bottle and some other uh, little features with the compost toilet. All right, this is the bathroom cabinet. Uh, of course, another compression latch. Uh, this one does not lock. You simply open it up, and now you have storage in the bathroom. I do want to point out where the light switch is for the lights here in the bathroom. It is a waterproof switch located up and under this cabinet. And then here we have a towel rod. Now you do have a bathroom window. The bathroom window works similar as the other windows in the camper. Uh, you have a little latch to unlock it and you can pull this up. It snaps and holds itself in place. 
uh, you have a screen and the screen itself can slightly open up as well uh, to allow a little bit of fresh air into the bathroom or a little bit of the steam or moisture out. To release this, you just simply press these clips, let it drop back into place, and then latch it back. Here at the dinette, we have a reading light. Uh, this reading light is operated by just pressing the lens in to turn it on and off. Here with the light above the dinette table, this is actually a touch light. So you don't have to go turn a switch off. You just simply slide your hand across it and the light turns on and off. And of course, on the other side, we have another reading light and it operates the same. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our window shades. Uh, the window shades on the window here has a night shade and a day shade. Uh, you can open and close the window with one hand. If you do, however, make sure that you do place your hand in the center. Uh, if you try to close it off side, uh, it'll kind of get off kiltered. Uh, but you just pull this up to open the shade. And then you can slide the day shade up. So the day shade uh, kind of allows a little bit uh, of sunlight to come into the camper. When the shades are open, you have access to your window. And the window works uh, same as all the other windows. You have a latch that you just simply unlock. You slide the window open. You have the screen. The screen slides open as well. Now, I do want to point out with the windows, they do have a uh, water track system and weep holes. So uh, when it does rain outside, water does fill up in the water track. And if you open this up, you can actually see a little bit of water filling up in one of these tracks with the black weather strip. That is normal. Um, you do want to make sure that you keep that cleaned out, though, so that it doesn't uh, clog up the weep system. Uh, if it clogs up, then some of that water could backfill into the camper. Here at the dinette, we have two cabinets. The cabinets, of course, have the same compression latches. Uh, when you open those up, on the inside you have storage space. Here on the rearward cabinet is the cell booster, uh, just in case you need to get to it. Typically, there's not, not a good reason to get to the cell booster unless you're just checking on it. That does lower down into a bed. Now, the first step, you'll want to reach up and under uh, to the thumb screws and make sure they're loose. Now, once you loosen both thumb screws, the table should be able to pull up and out of its bracket system and off the pole. You simply grab a hold of both sides of the dinette and shimmy it right off. Once you have that pulled off, you will want to go ahead and remove the pole. Now you have a collar at the bottom that may need to be loosened, and then you simply twist it and pull it out of its socket. Now once where you have the pole removed, you'll simply want to take the, the table and place it in its slot. Now that the table is in place, you'd simply slide the cushions down. And you have a small bed on the side. You will most likely want to go ahead and remove these thumb screws uh, out of the way and place them in a drawer for safekeeping. Go ahead and put the bed back into dinette mode. So we're going to go in reverse. We'll just simply push the cushions back into place. Slide the table out of its slot. going to reinstall the pole and I twist it in and then you can go ahead and slide this collar lock down. Now the next step you'll want to kind of line up with the pole to get it as close as possible. You'll hang the back side into the brackets, slide it down on the pole and then you'll want to go ahead and tighten these thumb screws. The, they don't have to be very tight. It's just basically to help stabilize this table so it's not rocking back and forth on this single pole. Here at the front dinette, we also have the GFCI. All other outlets in the camper do route through this, except for the outlet for the refrigerator. Uh, but if your outlets aren't working, you don't have power at your microwave, this may be one place to come to look. It has the test and reset button. You'd press the reset button, see if it pops. If it doesn't pop, um, then it may either not have been tripped or you may not have power coming in at all to the camper. 
uh, and then we'd want to look somewhere else. But this is a quick check just to see if this tripped and is the, the culprit from the no power issue. Now, if we look on the other side, you'll notice some 12 volt ports. One is a dual USB charger, and then one is your standard 12 volt cigarette uh, style uh, port. Uh, below those ports, we have the LP alarm. That LP alarm is wired directly to the battery with its own inline fuse. Uh, and of course, it tests for LP and carbon monoxide. And it has the light on the front of that panel that will tell you which one it is alarming for. Of course, here on the side of the dinette uh, is the other inside courtesy light. Uh, those are utilized at night uh, to go from the bedding area into the bathroom area. Now, if we go ahead and take a look underneath the dinette, uh, here we have a breaker panel. This is your AC panel. Uh, now, of course, depending on what options you get, some of these things may change. Uh, in this particular model we're looking at, it does actually have the lithium battery package, solar, and inverter. So this system is actually called a split system. Um, we actually have the AC panels in here that come through and power part of the system to the main uh, and then wired up through the inverter in order to hit the other side of the panel. This here is your 12 volt fuses uh, for all the 12 volt operated devices. So if anything's not working, uh, you might take a look here to see if a, a breaker has been tripped or a fuse has been blown. Our kitchen area we do have two above head cabinets same compression style latches that open up i would say with this one be careful if you drop it the compression latch will make contact with the metal uh, part of the microwave so just ease this one down once you get inside the cabinet for storage this is just a service port uh, to the main switches you do have an outlet here that powers the microwave and this outlet again is connected to the one gfci now, let's go ahead and take a look at our microwave. This particular model has the convection microwave in it. Uh, all of our campers do come standard with a standard microwave, but you can upgrade to the convection. A uh, little difference with it, uh, it is a slightly bigger, so you'll have this additional fiberglass piece that sticks out over the countertop, uh, but it does microwave and convection. Um, works pretty much just like any microwave you would have at home. Uh, you open the door, you set, uh, you actually have a little stand as well as the turntable. I do recommend when traveling to remove these items, especially the glass plate, as if you hit a bump and it was to hit the door, it could uh, knock the door open, damaging the door and breaking the plate. Now, one thing I would like to point out with the microwave, it does have a preheat feature, uh, but one of the things is, is uh, within a certain time frame. Uh, it wants to make sure that there is something inside here uh, being heated. Uh, even though with the preheat uh, feature, you may actually have to open the door and close the door to simulate it thinking you've put something inside. Otherwise, you may get a little alarm and, and it may say food. Let's go ahead and take a look below the microwave is our uh, refrigerator. It is a three-way fridge. It works on AC power, gas, and DC. Now, typically, uh, your first choice will always be the AC. Uh, if you're hooked to a shore power uh, or a generator, uh, you'll want to have it on AC. Uh, if you're not and you don't have that, the second would be LP gas. Your DC is really only uh, purpose is when you're driving. Uh, that way, some of that power from the truck's coming back to offset this. Now, right now, if you have lithium batteries, that's not the case. You don't actually have any power coming from the tow vehicle. Uh, and DC pulls a lot of battery power and does not cool the way that the AC and gas does. Now let's take a look at some of the different uh, settings here. You do have a temperature setting uh, where you can select uh, how cold you want it to be from one to nine. Nine is the coldest. Uh, in the mode, the mode allows you to uh, jump around to the different uh, mode settings for AC power, LP gas, DC, or auto. If you set this refrigerator in auto mode, the fridge will decide what mode uh, it goes to. It's first going to look for AC power. If AC power is not available, it's going to immediately switch to gas. If gas is not available, it will automatically go to DC power. 
Now, uh, again, DC power is not the most efficient cooling method and it does use up a lot of battery power. So you'd wanna to try to make sure uh, that it's only in DC when you want it to be in DC mode. Uh, of course, here at the end, you just have your own off uh, button. Now let's take a look inside. You just press this little lever and pull the fridge door open. Now on the inside, you do have shelving here in the door uh, and racks as well. Uh, on the free freezer section, you just lower the door down. One thing I do want to point out with the refrigerator is during storage, you'll want to pull everything out, turn the refrigerator off, and you'll definitely want to leave the door open so air can circulate through. To close it, you just simply press the door. Take a closer look at our kitchen area as well. Uh, now we do have two lights in the kitchen located under the cabinets. These are the touch style lights. So you can simply just rub the lens to get them to turn on and off. Here's our standard faucet. Um, and let's go ahead and remove the cutting board. The cutting board does come standard with every camper. For the faucet, you do have the pull down hose and you do have the switch to go from a standard to a spray format. And then you have your lever uh, that goes to hot and cold. If we take a look at our stove, you open the lid up and have access to the two burners. Now with the stove, uh, it's a pretty simple light. I typically recommend lighting the, the rear first and the front second as the, the rear is a little easier to light. Uh, and the front will light better if the rear has already been lit. To light these, you simply grab a hold, you press, turn it to light. Uh, you will start to hear it uh, tick, and then you press in a button in order to get it to go ahead and light. Once it's lit, you can kind of adjust the flame to where, where you want it. If uh, the stove does not light, you may want to just double check and make sure that your LP tanks are turned on. Now with the lid, the lid is designed, it will not close unless you pull up and then lower it down. Now if you've just finished using the stove, you don't want to immediately close this glass lid on top of a hot, uh, hot stove, so you may want to let it air out for a little while. Uh, one other thing to point out is when using this stove, you will want to have the main cabin fan on to help exhaust any fumes coming off of this. Taking a look at the kitchen galley drawers, uh, you have six. Uh, this one is a short drawer because it's located under the sink with the plumbing. All of our drawers are easy close. However, once they get to a certain point, you press it and it snaps into a 10 pound pull mechanism. Uh, point out 10 pound because if you place 20 pounds in the drawer, uh, there is a possibility that it will release from that clip and allow the drawer to open and move while traveling. So you want to keep in mind of how much weight you have in. Now all the other drawers are slightly bigger um, and of course the top right usually is where we uh, place all the remotes and everything that you'll receive when you come in to pick up your new Oliver tra travel trailer. Um, again, once you push it in, snap it in place. Now you don't have to do that while you're in here utilizing the drawers, but you do want to make sure they're all snapped into place before you travel. Here at the bottom, of the kitchen galley, you do have a duct vent. Uh, the vent, you can kind of spin this around, uh, telling the air a little different area to go. There is a deflector inside. So you do want to try to make sure that deflector inside is open or closed, depending on what you're wanting to do. One thing to keep in mind with all of these vents is there is requirement for a furnace in order to be able to push enough air out from the furnace. Uh, otherwise, if you close too, too many of these, that, that hot air will actually back up into the furnace, overheat it, and cause it to shut down prematurely. So keep that in mind and make sure that you do keep at least two of the vents in the camper fully in the open position. Here to the right side of our pantry, uh, this is the Xantrax Freedom uh, remote panel. Now this is an upgrade option, uh, only, you'll only get this if you get the inverter, uh, and this will actually control it. You press the, this button and it actually turns the inverter on. Now this button tells the inverter to take your 12 volt battery power and convert it into 120 volts. Uh, that would send that power out to your outlets as well as your microwave. 
One thing to keep in mind is that conversion rate is about 10 times. So any, any appliance that would typically utilize, say, 6 amps of power, uh, and your typical laptop pulls anywhere from 4 to 6 uh, amps of power, if you're running it through the inverter, that just became 40 or 60 amps of power. So that uh, over a time for something like a laptop, if you sit down for four or five hours to work, that's going to be a pretty, pretty big drain on the batteries. Something like your microwave does pull a lot of power, about 12, 13 amps, so that becomes 130 amps through the inverter. However, your microwave you only use for about five minutes, and so it, it doesn't become a big drain quite like something you'd plug in and continue to use over hours of time. Again, this button is only when you want it to convert 12 volt to 120. Otherwise, you can leave it off. When you're hooked to shore power, you'll still be getting readings on this panel. Uh, it should be telling you what the voltage is and that it is charging. However, um, if you don't have shore power and you do want to use it, you would have to press this button. Now, if we take a look below, we'll look at the Truma AquaGo. The Truma AquaGo switch, uh, there's a couple different settings here. The top setting is Eco Mode. Again, Eco Mode will tell the Truma to maintain the water temperature in the mixing vessel to 42 degrees. That ensures that it does not freeze. However, as soon as you open a faucet and water flow starts to go through the Truma, it will engage the flame and heat it up to 125. Now, the next stage below Eco Mode is the Comfort Mode. Comfort Mode keeps that mixing vessel at 102 degrees until you open a faucet. Uh, the center section is off. The next that looks like a little lightning bolt and snowflake is your winterization. Now that is an optional upgrade. You have to get the true antifreeze kit. If you get the true antifreeze kit and it is installed in the, in the water heater, you can turn it to here. And what that does is uh, runs 12 volt power over to the Truma and maintains that mixing vessel to ensure that it does not freeze. That would be uh, beneficial if you do a lot of winter camping and you're driving in freezing conditions. Um, because you're not going to want to leave the gas on to the Truma at that point, you would turn it to the winterization mode here. The very bottom is the clean mode. Now on the clean mode, that should only be used when the Truma tells you to do it, or uh, we include it in our yearly maintenance package simply because that way it's being done, uh, because when the Truma decides it needs to be cleaned, it's going to flash and repeatedly flash yellow to tell you it's got to be clean and it, then it's got to be done then. Uh, it will not produce any more hot water until it's clean, and that's the decalcification process. If you accidentally turn it to clean mode, it will lock it in clean mode, and then you will have to go through a process uh, of cleaning it uh, or fake cleaning it just to even get it out of clean mode. Uh, and of course, we do have some information on this and the clean mode process, getting it out online uh, through our service ticket system and the knowledge base. Below that's our sea level two monitor. Uh, it's gonna give you battery voltage readings. This reading should be similar to what you find on your inverter or your solar if you have those two options. Uh, it may be off slightly, but they should all be close. Uh, the fresh tank, you can press it and it'll give you a display of how much water is in your fresh tank. You press it twice and you'll get a little dot. And what that does is it'll keep that on the display. Uh, that's beneficial, so if you go outside, you hook the water hose up, you turn the faucet on, and you're filling your fresh tank, you could walk back in here and just kind of monitor it. Once it got up to around 80, 88 uh, percent, you'd want to go back out and turn the faucet off. Now with the gray tank, you do the same. You press it, and you can see uh, how much is in your gray tank. If you press it one without the dot, uh, it'll only stay up for a short period of time. And the same with the black. One thing I want to point out on the sensors with the sea uh, level uh, monitoring system is it's like a circuit board with small sensors. Um, it's got about a 13% variance, which means it could say 13% and be empty. It could say 100% and take more water. Um, so it's not 100% accurate. Uh, part of it depends on the, the sensors. Uh, it also is a gravity type system for our tanks. So if the camper is nose down, all that water runs to the front of the tank and away from the sensor, thereby giving you a false reading. If it slightly nose up, that water will run to the back and, and reach a higher level on the sensor, giving you a slightly false reading. Um, if you actually put about a half a gallon of water in the tank, raise it all the way to the front, all that water hits the back, it can actually show full. So 
just just to uh, keep that in mind. Now you do have the water pump switch here as well. Uh, again, the one that's in the vanity, but there's one here as well. So you can turn it on here or there, uh, it doesn't matter. Here on the side of the pantry at the dinette, we have our thermostat. Our thermostat controls our fan that is located on the air conditioner, our actual AC compressor, uh, and our furnace. Now one thing I want to point out, um, the power, the mode is the same button and it's a capacitive touch style thermostat. You just barely touch it and it'll light up and you can start going through the different modes. The first mode uh, goes into fan. One of the things I want to point out with this is if you change the fan speed, you have auto, high, and low. If you change it to high or low and then set the furnace, the fan will still run in high or low because it thinks you want it to run. So when using the furnace, you'll definitely want to use the auto feature. Uh, however, when you're using the air conditioner, uh, if you're like me, you'll want to set it to one speed or the other. Both of them, as far as decibel sound, are fairly similar. Uh, so it's hard to tell the difference between the two speeds. However, in auto mode, uh, if it's running in high and wants to switch to low, it shuts itself all the way down before it engages the next fan speed. Uh, it can actually make you feel like the compressor hall air conditioner is shutting off only to immediately turn itself back on. But that's the fan part doing that. I like to set it to low. That way I have a little lower decibel sound uh, and it's just a consistent speed and I don't have that starting and stopping. Uh, of course, once you have it in mode, um, you can press the up and down buttons to set those different uh, fan speeds. Uh, you can also press mode and put it into the air conditioner mode. Again, the up and down arrows uh, to set your temperature and then furnace as well. Now, uh, one of the features uh, when you have it in here, if you press both at the same time, it'll change it to Celsius. Press it both at the same time, turns it back to Fahrenheit. I only tell you that because sometimes people accidentally put it in Celsius, um, but that's the way that you would do it, Celsius back to Fahrenheit. Let's go ahead and take a look at our pantry. Again, same style compression latch. You open the door and on the inside we have two racks and a bottom area. Uh, some of the things that do come in here, uh, one, uh, you should receive a little fuse box. Um, the screws are for the access panels. Uh, you will get one 30 amp slow blow fuse um, with the camper. If you want to purchase others, they, they are for sale through the service department. And then we provide a few different of the ATC style blade fuses for your 12 volt panel. If you have purchased the shower curtain option, you will receive a shower curtain. Now this shower curtain is cut specifically for the radius of the bathroom. Uh, so it is a custom special made uh, shower curtain. One of the things here at the pantry I do want to show you is this countertop. You actually can pull up. It's just Velcroed in place and it does expose a little bit extra storage area under here. And below this countertop is our switch for our courtesy light. This switch that has no label, uh, the mystery switch is just your inside courtesy lights. Here towards the bottom, we do have another outlet here at the uh, street side rear bed area. Uh, for your convenience. Again, that outlet is tied into the same GFCI of all the other outlets under the dinette. Here we have our solar charge controller and radio. So we're going to take a look at our solar charge controller first. Now, the first light here is a red light that's just uh, for power. Ours is blinking because uh, we're actually inside a building, so our solar panels aren't actually taking a charge. Um, if they are taking a charge, this little lightning bolt will have a blue light showing that. And then you have your different battery status levels. Uh, this shows a full battery. Um, most of the time when you're in your camper utilizing it, you're going to see it more in this stage. Uh, it takes a lot to get full and typically if you have all your lights and you're using stuff, it's not going to get fully charged. Uh, this is about 50% battery capacity, which is roughly 12 volts. Uh, once you get here, uh, and it starts dropping below 12 volts, you'll have certain things that uh, may start alarming inside for voltage loss. Uh, and then once it gets to a certain point, um, they'll stop working altogether. If your voltage drops below about 11 volts, you may actually uh, blow some of the fuses by trying to use some of the appliances. Uh, as voltage drops, your amperage on that 
increases and as amperage increases, if it goes over the max allowed for that wire, it'll actually blow the fuse. Uh, one of the primary things is the jacks. Uh, the jacks, uh, if it drops below 11 volts, uh, the jack is a pretty large load um, and, and that would cause it to blow the fuse. So here uh, you can keep an eye on your voltage. You've got two buttons uh, on the charge controller. Uh, one simply for the battery type that's preset for you. So you shouldn't have to change that ever unless you change the batteries to a different battery type. Say you purchased it with AGM batteries and two years later you put lithiums then that would need to be changed to set to the life PO4 for lithium. Um, on the top button, the amp volt, uh, you can press it once. This first setting with the A shows right now how many amp hours the solar is pulling in. We're not pulling anything in because we're inside a building. The next, you can press it and it changes to AH. This will give you that day's rating, how many total amp hours your solar has pulled in and sent to the batteries for the day. Now that will reset every day. Below the solar charge controller, we have our new Furion radio. Now it works similar to pretty much any other radio. You have your power button uh, that you turn on. You have uh, volume control. Uh, here you just have different things to select through your menus, your aux settings. BT just stands for Bluetooth because you can Bluetooth connect to this, uh, play music from your phone to the radio, take phone calls through the radio, and it'll be played through the speakers. Um, you can switch AM, FM, uh, your disc, your USB port. Now with your USB port, uh, if you plug anything in here, it does need to be uh, like say music that is all on the USB port itself, not in folders. Uh, that way it can read it and play it accordingly. Uh, of course, you've got an HDMI in that, that you could use if you choose to uh, headphone jack as well. Uh, over here, you've got uh, a few buttons. Zone one, two, and three are for the speakers. We only use zone one and two. Uh, if you press zone one and turn them off, you'll notice that the little one here disappeared. Uh, that just simply means the, the two speakers attached to zone one will no longer play sound. If I turn zone two off, now the, the radio has no outlet to play the sound to, so we wouldn't be getting any sound even if we turn this volume up. Nothing's going to come through. All right. And again, zone three is not utilized. Um, however, if you decided to add additional speakers yourself later on, you could attach those to, to zone three. Now, the other things are just your play, pause, stop, rewind, forward. Uh, those are utilized for the DVD player to control. And you do have your phone button here uh, to utilize as well and a mute button. So this is the radio remote. Uh, it does come with every camper, uh, so that way you don't actually have to get up and come over to the radio. Uh, you can have this at the dinette uh, or in the bed uh, and control the radio from there. Uh, this does actually provide a little bit more uh, features or access into the menu settings uh, than directly on the radio itself. So you do want to hold on to the remote and use that when necessary. Let's go ahead and talk about the Max Air fan. Now a few things, this is a manual control to open and close the lid. However, typically you should not have to use this. You have controls directly here on the fan itself. You have an on off switch. When you press on, it's gonna to go to its last feature that was set, whether that be in or out. Uh, of course, when you're using the stove in the kitchen, you do wanna make sure this fan is on and you have it going to the out position. Uh, this button here changes the direction of that fan, so you can press this to go in or out. Uh, and then these actually control the speed of that fan, even though it says open and close. The minus controls the down speed plus goes up. Uh, of course, you can go ahead and press the off button and close it. Now, the hood on this is waterproof, so you can utilize this when it's raining. However, you do not want to leave it open while traveling because the force of the wind would suck that water back inside the can. If you ever want to clean the fan, uh, it is pretty simple. These little clips slide open. Once they've slid out of the way, you just kind of pull this screen down and now you have access to the blades, uh, to the inside section of the hood there. That way, every once in a while, you can clean these uh, fans out. There we go. 
uh, this is the Max Air Fan remote. Um, you can control the Max Air Fan from this. Uh, you simply press the on off button, uh, turns it on, opens it up, uh, blows air in or out based on its last setting. Now the plus and minuses adjust the set temperature. Um, you can tell this to be in auto mode. Uh, and what that does is say the room temperature currently is 69 degrees and I want it to be 74. Uh, if I push auto mode, it's going to automatically determine if it needs to bring air in or take air out to try to get to that set temp. However, this is not an air conditioner or a heater. Um, so all it can do is either take air out or bring air in. Uh, the little uh, large fan, lower fan is the speed of the fan. Um, so this adjusts the speed percentages up and down. And then the circle here is for the air out or air in. Of course, once you're done, you can just simply press the on off button, turn it off. Uh, within a few seconds, the, the backlight will go off on its own. Now this does come with a mount. If you want to mount it somewhere, we do not mount it, um, but you can mount this little thing uh, and hang it on the wall inside the camper. Uh, we will have it just in the top right drawer of your camper once you arrive. Here in the bed area, we have the above head air conditioner. Uh, now, typically you're going to interact with this uh, through the thermostat. Uh, the only things that you'll really want to come back here to do will be to open and close some of the vents uh, and periodically check the filters. Uh, keep in mind with every vent that you close, the outside air conditioner is right on top. So it's dumping that air at a high velocity inside. The more vents are closed, the louder it's going to sound. Uh, so opening up the vents will quieten it down just a little bit because you're giving that air that's coming in at that high velocity somewhere to go other than being stopped by this plastic uh, inside cover. Now, uh, of course, you've got this bottom uh, vent, the front vent, rear vent, and you have two little side vents that can open up and close. Uh, the other things are the filters, which are located here in the front, one on each side. You just slide them out. Uh, these filters can just be rinsed off, uh, allow them to dry, and then you'd place them back inside the air conditioner. Uh, you don't want to force them. They are um, a little long, so you want to make sure you're gentle when putting them back in place. We're going to take a look at the Legacy Elite 2 and putting the rear dinette table down into bed mode. Uh, the first thing we will want to do is remove the tabletop itself and kind of situate it out of the way so we can remove the poles. Uh, it is a little heavy and awkward, so if you have someone to help, uh, it may be best. If not, just try to grab both sides, pull it straight up off of the poles, and then set it off to one side. Once you do that, uh, at the base of each uh, table leg, there is a collar that will have to be loosened up before we can get it out of the base plate. Turn it to the left until it's loose. Grab a hold of the pole and then turn it to the left as well until it comes up and out of the base. Now we'll want to store these legs in the closet. And while we're there, we're going to retrieve the filler panel. Inside the closet, uh, next to the plumbing pipe, there should be a filler panel uh, for all standard bed uh, floor plans. You'll just, before we put the filler panel in, we're gonna go ahead and put the bed uh, table down. Uh, now in the Legacy Elite 2, the table goes in the rear and the filler panel in front. But we're gonna go ahead and uh, place this down under the cushions in these little channels right on top of this foam. Now that the table is in place, we're going to go ahead and lay the filler panel down as well. Now we're going to take each side and just slide it out over the table, dropping the back cushion down. And once all of the cushions are down flat, we're ready to make up the bed. Here on the street side bed area, we're going to go over a few things. Uh, above the bed, of course, you've got another cabinet, same compression latch as the others. 
uh, opens and close. Uh, we will take a look inside that particular cabinet here shortly, but first let's go ahead and go over everything else. Uh, you have your same touch light here in the bed area. Uh, of course, you've also got uh, your reading lights at the front and rear of the bed. Now, they operate the same as the ones at the dinette. Uh, and of course, the window shade uh, and your window uh, operate exactly as the, the stuff at the dinette area as well. We're going to take a look at the window shade and how to remove it from the window and reinstall. So what you'll want to do is grab a hold of the bottom rail and we're just going to pull straight out away from the window. It's going to pop off of the metal clips underneath. Uh, there's three on the bottom and there should be three on top as well. Once we have the bottom removed, we would just pull the top off. Now I want to take a look at the back of it. Um, you'll see here the plastic rail on the back of the window shade. That's where the metal clips sit. Uh, anytime that you pull it off, you will want to double check, make sure all the clips are good. Make sure if any are loose, you may need to tighten them up a little bit. Um, you also check um, the plastic rail on the back here. Over time, removing and reinstalling this, the plastic will start to wear against the metal. Um, and you may find that you need to either replace the window shade or relocate the metal clip so it's no longer biting in the same spot in this uh, plastic rail here. Uh, once you get ready to reinstall it, you will hang the top section first. You just simply line it up with the metal clips. You'll have to give it a firm press at each clip location. Once you have it hung on the top, you'll do the same with the bottom. Just kind of line it up. And now your window shade is back in place. If we move on back here, uh, you have your smoke alarm here. Uh, it's standard, just like one you'd have at your home. Uh, it's screwed onto a base, you pull it off. Uh, it's actually got batteries in it, just like one at home would have. And then you'd simply place it back on the base and reattach it. All right, behind this smoke alarm, we have more 12 volt ports. You've got your dual USB charger and your standard cigarette style. Now let's go ahead and move over towards our TV and nightstand area. Now the nightstand, of course, is just available in the twin bed uh, models. Uh, this one does have a compression latch. Uh, this compression latch is here, uh, so that way while you're driving the forward motion and anything inside the drawer that moves around uh, and slides forward will maintain and keep this closed. So to open this, you do have to open the compression latch and then pull the drawer open. Uh, of course, it's the easy close. It does not have the 10 pound push pull because we do have the compression latch on this one. As long as this is latched, this should not come open. Um, now below, in this particular model, uh, it's got a, an optional upgrade added to it, which is the um, basement access from inside. So you can open this up and then get to that outside basement area. Uh, this is really good for when you're back here in the bed if you want to stow your shoes or something like that while you sleep uh, and then open it up and pull it out. That way they're not right here in the floor if you have to get up in the middle of the night. On the top of the nightstand, it is removable just like the one at the pantry. Uh, once you remove it, you actually have a little basket inside and the basket is removable. Uh, once you remove this, you could actually get to that drawer without even opening the drawer. This just drops right back into place, and then this just simply goes right back onto the Velcro. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the rear window. Um, the rear window shade operates the same as the others. It's a little bit smaller, uh, but you've got your night and your day shade. Here for the rear window, the glass does slide. The screen does not. On the rear window, this is your emergency exit window, so this screen does not uh, slide. It does have a little red tab here. That red tab is to yank this out. You remove that screen, and then you can get to this handle. So to open this, you just simply pull these two handles up, push the window open. Now it does not have anything that holds it, so you're gonna have to use your body as you crawl out and slide down the spare tire cover. To reattach, you just simply pull it in, pop these handles back in place, slide the sliding window back over. 
Now, to reattach these, as you see these little clips, they're just like snap clips. So we're just gonna place this back into the frame. I usually like to set the bottom clips on the rail and then just press the top clips right back in until they snap closed. One thing I do wanna mention about the window shades is when traveling, uh, if the shades are left down, definitely do not leave the windows open. Uh, that airflow would come in and damage the window shades. Here we have our flip down TV in the rear. Uh, to disengage, you give it a slightly press, brings it down into place. It does rotate, uh, so you could turn it. And this person wanted to watch TV while this person was reading a book. Spin it back into place. And then, of course, to stow it before you go, you just press it up and it'll lock itself in place. Now, let's go ahead and turn the TV on so that we can take a look at a few things. This new TV is uh, an AC powered smart TV. Uh, so the remote that comes with it, you do actually have the ability, if you are in an area where you have Wi-Fi, uh, to do Netflix, Amazon, any kind of uh, Wi-Fi smart TV options uh, are available on this TV. Uh, of course, the remote, remote's going to work just like any TV at home. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is this has different cables running to it. Uh, so when you're using different things, you'll have to use the uh, source or input button in order to select uh, which ones you're wanting. Uh, on this one, it is the top left input button there, and it'll uh, scroll through your HDMI, um, your cable port, your TV, all those different component settings. Now keep in mind, this TV is an AC powered TV, so you're gonna have to be connected to shore power or have an inverter and turn the inverter on in order to send power to this TV. Once the TV powers on, then you can just select, uh, like I said, which input you want, pressing an input button, scrolls through all the different uh, available features. Once you select the one that you uh, want to, to view, you just have to set it up. So I've selected HDMI 1. There's nothing either powered on or connected to HDMI 1. Uh, however, uh, the HDMI cable is run to the top section in the attic. Uh, that is for an add-on, like say you wanted to add a Blu-ray player uh, or anything, uh, Apple TV. Uh, you could also hook uh, a laptop up to it as well. Uh, I do want to keep, uh, show this as well. When the TV is in the down position in this cabinet above, if you were to drop this, it would make contact with the TV screen, which you do not want. Uh, it would, would break that. So definitely be careful opening uh, this while the TV is in the down position. Let's go ahead, stow the TV, and take a look at that rear cabinet area. Here in the rear cabinet area, uh, here's the HDMI cable that's connected to the TV. It's uh, placed up here so you could put, uh, like I said, an Apple TV or Blu-ray player or some device here to connect to the TV. Over here, you have an outlet, which is the outlet your TV is connected to. Um, again, it's connected to that same GFCI, a 12-volt cigarette port, and this particular model has the Omni HD antenna. The Omni HD antenna uh, has two antennas inside it, uh, one that runs back here to the TV and one to the radio. So to turn it on and be able to use it, you do have to press this little white button. The red light will come on, telling you that it's sending power to the TV antenna. Uh, and at this point, we should be able to do a TV scan uh, or a radio scan to, to get signal. Now, with this antenna, um, it, it only works in an area that's broadcasting those local TV stations. And the further away you get, the less channels you will get until you get no channels. Uh, a lot of times in a lot of state parks, you're not going to be able to, to get any channels. Uh, and even here in our own parking lot on one side of the building, we can only pick up three. On the other side of the building, we can get about 10. Um, so other obstacles that are in the way sometimes impede that as well. And you do have your uh, satellite connection. Uh, if you hook a satellite receiver back here uh, and a TV out uh, connection as well. Uh, it's typically okay to leave this on most of the time uh, unless you just want to switch it off. <clears throat> here on this side of the attic is your surge protector display. This display will only light up when you are connected to a 120 volt power source. So it's gonna to have to be at a campground if you hook up at your house or if you're connected to a generator. And it's gonna be scrolling um, red 
and scrolling information through it. Uh, it's going to tell you what the current voltage is, what the amp load is, uh, the hertz reading, and you should typically see E0. That E0 means no errors. Uh, if you see anything other than E0, like an E1 through an E10, there is a problem. If you see an E0 and then immediately following that a PE number, that means you're having intermittent issues. Um, even if it's just intermittent issues, you may still want to contact us or Progressive uh, because some intermittent issues like low voltage at campgrounds can end up resulting um, in issues with your power cord or power inlet on the side of the camper. Uh, and damages like that are not covered under any of the warranties because it's a power issue at that campground. Now, you will notice that it does have a switch, normal use and bypass EMS. Progressive Industries and Oliver Travel Trailers does not recommend that you use the bypass EMS. If you do that, uh, it still protects against a large power surge. However, it will not protect against reverse polarity, ground issues, low voltage, high voltage. Um, and if you have something like that occurring, uh, the power would still be allowed into the camper and could result in damage. Uh, now, one thing to point out with the surge protector, um, say it did take a large blast of, of voltage and it fries the surge protector. That's its purpose. Sacrifice itself so that nothing else gets damaged. Uh, and if something like that happens, um, again, that, that's a result of the power coming in, not a fault of the surge protector. It's there to stop that power from coming in. Uh, now, if you're looking at it right now, of course it's dead because we do not have 120 volt power connected. It will remain off and only come on when 120 volt is connected. We're going to take a look at the Cradle Point. Uh, it is our new Wi-Fi option. It's available on both the uh, Legacy Elite and Legacy Elite 2 models. Uh, now, with this, what it does is it use, utilizes a cell antenna. Uh, and it reaches out, brings that cell signal into the camper, into a Wi-Fi router, uh, and then it allows you to turn that into your own dedicated Wi-Fi signal uh, inside the camper. Now, it does have the two bands, 2.5 gig and the uh, 5 gigahertz uh, bands. Uh, the 5 is a little bit faster and works really nice inside the camper. The 2.5 uh, is, is not as fast, but it does go a little bit further. Uh, and you may actually be able to utilize it and stay connected even inside the tow vehicle. Now, if you see here, the cradle point does appear that it is mounted upside down. However, we did this on purpose so that you can uh, see the, the status lights on this side without having to try to get a mirror and look to the back backside. Uh, the backside has some, some ports and things like that, but we don't use those. Um, but with this particular system, it comes with two SIM cards, an AT&T and a Verizon. Uh, you can only use one at a time. Both can be left inside the router and you would simply contact the mobility help desk and set up a data plan on one uh, or the other SIM card. Once you have your data plan, uh, you can get unlimited or a certain amount each month. Um, you can also shut that down. Uh, because this is going into a camper and you're not always going to be out and on the road, you can contact them uh, and kind of pause it or, or shut it down for a while until you get ready to go back out on the road again. Uh, you can also uh, get an app uh, and set up an account uh, through them so that you can manage this uh, yourself. Of course, all of those questions, you'd need to contact the mobility help desk to actually uh, speak with them uh, to get all that information together. But uh, once you get this option at delivery, you'll also be given kind of a, a little piece of paper with all the information as far as who to contact uh, for the data plan setting it up. Uh, you can also have uh, troubleshooting assistance from uh, two different companies, one being Oliver and the other being uh, who we actually purchased the Cradle Point uh, through. Uh, and you can also actually call Cradle Point as well. Uh, so you have definitely plenty of people to, to get assistance from. Here we're uh, taking a look at the uh, curbside bed area. Uh, of course, it has the same reading lights uh, as the street side, same functionality, and the touch light above the bed. Uh, of course, you have another window shade and window on this side as well, uh, where both the sliding glass and the screens open. Now here we have another cabinet above head uh, for storage. It, it works and operates the same as the others with the compression latch. 
Uh, one thing that is different over here on this side uh, is the rear outlet. Uh, we have a 120 volt outlet on this side where the street side has the 12 volt ports. This outlet again is connected to the one main GFCI like all the other outlets. Of course here we're taking a look at the uh, display for the rear camera. Uh, again, like we said, it could be used inside the camper if you wanted to see what's happening behind you or you can place this in the tow vehicle and uh, utilize it while driving uh, and backing up. Uh, now, keep in mind for this to connect to the rear camera, the camera switch at the front entry door has to be in the own position, sending power back to the camera. Uh, on this, you do have a few features uh, where you can actually turn the volume up or down. So if you're getting some weird static or some kind of feedback like that through the, the monitor, it's because you've got the speakers turned on. I would just recommend turning the speakers all the way down and that will go away. And then just power it on or off. Now here on the street side bed cabinet area, I did want to point out one thing. If you open this cabinet and you look inside, there's a red switch. This red switch is a cutoff for the solar. Uh, so if you're putting it up in storage, you may want to go ahead and cut that off. It's also here for servicing of the solar, um, but it is located just to the left uh, of the solar charge controller inside the cabinet above the street side bed area. You may also notice this little port here. Uh, that's just a service port uh, to the wiring behind the radio and the charge controller. going to take a look under our front dinette uh, access panel. Uh, now as the sticker says, this is not a storage compartment. Uh, you do have plumbing lines, mostly your waste uh, lines running through here. We'll go ahead and pull this open. I want to take a look on the inside. Um, on the inside here, uh, this is the three inch uh, gate valve for your black tank. Of course, it's operated from the pull handle outside. Uh, if you look uh, over here on the one and a half inch pipe, this is your backflow preventer. Of course, this model has the uh, upgraded uh, option for the auto uh, feature with the uh, power button inside the closet. Uh, otherwise, this handle would go inside the, the bathroom for a pull handle. Uh, of course, most of this is just for servicing. Um, and again, this is not a storage compartment. Under the rear dinette seat, uh, another access panel. Now this is not a storage compartment either. Uh, and this is also just typically for service. I'm gonna open it up just to show you underneath. Now with this particular camper, it has your 30 amp convenience port in the front as well as the standard on the side. So it has the additional transfer relay uh, on the wheel well. Uh, if you look inside, you'll see our main ground bar with all of the, the yellow wires attached. And then uh, most of the other wiring, 12 volt going into the 12 volt panel, uh, and then the Romex going into the back side of the AC panel. Uh, on this inside wall section, we actually have the surge protector mounted, uh, but that's the main surge protector. Uh, and of course, the display, uh, the remote display is located in that rear attic. Uh, we do have one relay located in this area uh, here. That relay is for the water pump. But again, this is primarily a service access panel. Under the street side bed area, on the front access panel, again, not a storage compartment. We'll open this up. And below, we actually have access to the rear jack. Uh, if this jack did not operate, this is where you'd wanna go to use that manual crank, crank it up or down. If you look further inside the access panel, this is where the inverter is mounted if you opted for that option. Now, uh, if you look further on the side of this wheel well inside is where the main 12 volt breaker is located. Uh, so your main power coming into the camper from the batteries hits the breaker. Uh, if that breaker trips, we basically lose the 12 volt power coming inside. Inside this access panel is where your jack fuses are located. Your LP uh, inline fuse is located as well as your compost toilet fan fuse. Um, all of those fuses will be located here under the bed uh, and you also have a uh, breaker for the inverter located in this area. Uh, depending on which inverter you get, you'll either have a 200 amp breaker or a 300 amp breaker. 
But let's get into a closer look at those fuses and the breaker systems on the side of the wheel well. Here on the wheel well is the main 12 volt breaker. Uh, you've got a little red button and this little arm here. If it's tripped uh, and we lose all light, that's because the breaker has been tripped. You just simply press this little arm back into place. Now you've got your hot side of the breaker uh, and your breaker side. On the breaker side, um, we do have this inline fuse. This is for the compost toilet. You'd simply grab a hold, twist it loose to get to the inside fuse section, and then just press it back together and twist it back together. All right, the yellow capsules are for your jacks. You have one uh, for each rear jack and one for the front jack. And you may notice that the front jack has one uh, at the front jack as well. All, uh, all items must be fused uh, within a certain amount of inches from the power source, the power source being the batteries. So we install a fuse on this side. Uh, the fuse on the front is left because it actually comes from the manufacturer with that already built into it. Now, you'll notice here, we have a one-out fuse. That one-out blade fuse is for your LP alarm. It is run to the hot side to make sure that that LP alarm always has power going to it, even if this breaker trips for safety reasons. Uh, some of the other wiring in here is just some of your main wires, your safety breakaways, uh, your seven pin charge if you don't have lithium batteries. Um, most of all of that would be for service purposes, but these fuses uh, you may actually need to check from time to time. Now this is where the inverter is mounted inside here. Typically, you shouldn't have to get in here to the inverter. Uh, you do notice you've got a display here and a button. However, it comes with a remote display, which we've already covered, and that's the way you would want to interact with the inverter 99% of the time. If you ever turn the inverter on from this switch, then the remote will not function properly. So you want to make sure this one is left in the off position and operate it from the remote switch. Now, there is a breaker uh, located all the way up and under uh, here for the, the inverter uh, between its positive line out to the battery. Um, so if your inverter is not working, you may want to look up under here and see if this breaker has tripped. One other item, if you've got the solar port, uh, you'll also notice an inline fuse as well for it under here. Um, so, so you may need to check it if for some reason you're not getting power in from your portable units. All right, taking a look under the street side bed, the rear access panel. Now you'll notice this one does not have a sticker that says this is not a storage compartment. And that is because it is a storage compartment. Uh, it actually gives you access to that outside storage area, what we call the basement. So you have access to the basement from inside. It is under the bed, but you could open it up and reach in there to get something that you've, you've stowed below. Now that we've looked at the curbside, or the street side, I mean, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the curbside. Here on the curbside bed area, the rear access panel, again, not a storage compartment. All right, so under this rear access panel on the curbside, we have access to our furnace and our water heater. Uh, typically, there's not really any reason that you would need to get in here to the furnace, um, except for a service facility. Uh, if there's something that they were doing to it. For the water heater, there is one thing that you need to be aware of, which is the bypass valve. That bypass valve is gonna be utilized when you winterize the camper. And what that does is simply bypass uh, that incoming antifreeze so it does not go into the water heater, but rather up this bypass hose and down the hot water lines. If you look all the way down towards the bottom of the furnace or the water heater, you'll notice the bypass valve. It's a brass valve. Right now it's turned in the direction to the rear of the camper. When you turn it to the rear of the camper, it's pointing towards the bypass hose, which means that's the flow uh, direction that, that the liquid will flow in. Once you get ready to dewinterize or actually use your water heater, you would simply just turn the valve towards the side of the camper uh, and that would allow the water to enter into the water heater uh, and then come out this top port and down the hot water lines. Here we've left one of the hypervent mats in so we could take a look at it. Um, now this is an optional upgrade as well. What this does is under the mattress being on a solid surface, you may have moisture that builds up that can create mold or mildew on the bottom side of the mattress. Also when we sleep, we tend to um, release moisture 
uh, and that will go through the mattress uh, and be trapped at the bottom. This is to allow a little bit of airflow and work similar to, like I said, a box springs on a traditional bed. Uh, so this is something that is recommended to get. That way that airflow just allows to go under there and kind of get rid of some of that moisture. But we'll go ahead and remove this so we can take a look under the access panels on the curbside. Right here on the curbside bed front access panel, uh, we're going to go ahead and just remove this panel. Now under here is the access to our water pump, our water pump valves uh, that configure uh, where the uh, pump actually pulls the water or liquid from and where it puts uh, the water to. Uh, you also have access to your other jack in case you ever need to, to manually crank the jack. Now let's take a closer look at the, the water valves. You basically have two valves on the left. Those two valves on the left tell the water pump where to pull from and the two on the right tell it where to deliver the liquid to. So the first one here tells this one to pull from the freshwater tank. If you close it and open this one, it's telling it to pull from that rear port uh, by the bumper. Now these faucets here tell, or, or these valves here tell it where to go. This one delivers it out to all the faucets inside the camper, your kitchen, your bathroom. This one, if open, would tell the water to come through here and fill the tank. That would be utilized if you were sanitizing your tank or uh, boondocking and refilling the tank from a jug from that rear port. Now your standard setup will be this one open, this one closed, this one closed, and this one open. Now what that does is allows you to hook up to city water. Your city water will come in through here, fill these lines automatically, and bypass the uh, water pump system. It will back flow feed through here, but there's a check valve that stops the water uh, from feeding back through and into the tank. Now, uh, you'd also utilize this when filling the freshwater tank. You'd fill it full and then come in here and turn the water pump on. The water pump's going to pull from this line from the tank. Uh, it's not going to pull from here as it's closed, but it would deliver it through this pipe out to the faucets. Now, one other valve located inside this uh, access panel is all the way on the bottom. Um, it's located on the bottom because it's your drain valve for your freshwater tank. So it does have to be located towards the bottom of the camper. Uh, it's still a silver valve just like these. So you would have to crawl in there, go underneath to find where it's located at. Sometimes the furnace duct may be in the way, so you may have to move it kind of out of the way in order to locate that valve. Uh, one other thing to point out while we're here is the filter for the water pump. Uh, you may want to uh, inspect it and clean this out regularly. Uh, but it is located here on the right side, and it's just this little glass uh, piece here. Remove that, dump, empty it out, uh, and then put it back on. Thank you for watching our video today uh, with the delivery walkthrough of an Elite 2. Welcome to Oliver Travel Trailers. Today we're going to take a look at the Anderson weight distribution hitch and how to properly disconnect from the tow vehicle and then reconnect when you're ready to take off. Let's go ahead and take a look now. First step we want to do is go ahead and disconnect the seven pin from the tow vehicle. You'll always want to disconnect this because if you leave it hooked up overnight, it'll go ahead and continue pulling 12 volt power from the tow vehicle and cause it to drain the batteries. Now we do run the cable through this little metal clip in the Bulldog coupler. Uh, we do that just to secure this cable a little better. You can go ahead and remove that as well. Kind of put that seven pin cable off to the side. First, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect the breakaway cable. Then we'll go ahead and take our chains loose. Now once we have our chains loose, the next step is going to be disconnecting the Anderson weight distribution hitch. Now on that, what we're going to do, the easiest method that we have found is go ahead and leave this connected here at the ball and raise the front end of the camper just a little bit. What we're trying to do is remove the 
uh, tongue weight from the tow vehicle, and it's gonna put some slack in these chains here that are currently tight. Once we've raised it up a little bit, now we have that slack in the, in the chains, we can go ahead and pull the pin. Sometimes this may be a little tight. You may have to wiggle this as you pull the pin out. But once you've got the pin out of the way, you can just drop that. Then you'd want to go ahead, lower the jack or the camper. Once we've got it lowered back down, then we can go ahead and pop open the coupler, raise the jack off of the tow vehicle. And at this point, uh, you just simply pull the tow vehicle forward, go ahead and level up the camper, and you're ready to go. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at hooking back up the tow vehicle once we're breaking camp, getting ready to go. The first thing, of course, you'll wanna do is pull the tow vehicle up and under the coupler. Uh, once you've got it lined up, we'll go ahead and just drop the trailer down on the tow vehicle. All right. Now, once we have it down, we'll go ahead and set the coupler lock on there. Now at this point, because we're looking at the Anderson weight distribution hitch, we're gonna wanna hook it up. The easiest way is to go ahead, now that we've got this coupled, we're gonna raise the front of the trailer back up a little bit. And I typically wanna raise it until I see all of the weight taken off of the hitch here. Once we do that, we wanna go ahead and just take the little triangle plate, stretch the chains forward slide it up on the bottom of that ball, and then we should be able to put our pin through. All right. Now that we've got that locked in, we can go ahead and drop the camper back down. Mm -hmm. And our Anderson chains are good and tight at this point. Now what we'll want to do is go ahead and hook our tow chains up. We typically crisscross these. All right. You'll want to connect your safety breakaway as well. Make sure this is always connected to the tow vehicle. You do not want to connect this to the safety chains or something that could come loose from the tow vehicle. Then of course, we'll wanna go ahead and put our pin through the coupler to lock it down and in place. Placing our seven pin cable inside just so that it kinda helps hold it there and secure. And then we just plug our seven pin into the tow vehicle. At this point, you'd wanna just do a walk around of the camper, double check the rear jacks and check the lights and you're good to go. Sometimes when backing into a campsite, you may find that in order to get the trailer straight and in the campsite, the truck itself may be at a slight angle. Now this is okay, and if you take a look here, you'll notice the triangle plate chains, everything is still nice and straight with the camper itself, but the ball housing and the ball mount with the truck is at a slight angle. Now, this does not change the way that you would disconnect the Anderson ball at this time. However, uh, in a moment, we will look at how it might change reconnecting to the Anderson. Uh, but it, again, at this point, it's not gonna change the way that we disconnect. We'd simply lower our jack, which we'll go ahead and do now. Now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and lower the jack down so I can take the pressure off the back of the truck. It'll give us some slack in our chains and make it a lot easier to go ahead and drop the triangle plate from the Anderson ball. First, I'm gonna look at right, uh, raising it just enough so that I see a little bit of movement in that ball mount. Uh, that'll tell me that it's removed the weight from the ball, uh, but we don't wanna lift the back end of the truck. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and just take the pin out. We can drop our chains. Right. Now before we go ahead and pull the coupler open, we're gonna wanna go ahead and lower the camper back down because right now we've pulled up on that ball. If we were to go ahead and pop it loose, it'll snap the two apart. So we wanna go ahead and put some of that weight back down on the ball. And 
and then once we have it open, we just go ahead and take the camper completely off the back of the truck. So pretty much the same exact disconnect method, uh, even though we are at an angle. However, now what we want to look at is when we get ready to hook back up, if we are able to pull in straight and back up and connect straight, how that's going to affect the Anderson and what to do if that happens. All right, so now we want to look at it to where we've backed up and we're getting ready to reconnect to the Anderson. Now, when we disconnected, we were at an angle with the truck, but now you can see we're straight in line with the camper. If you look a little closer though at our pin, it's not going straight across the ball. It's kind of turned to an angle, which is gonna make it difficult to get the triangle plate back on. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. The way that Anderson recommends is actually to loosen uh, from the brackets until you can get the triangle plate on and then tighten the side you need to to get it to turn that ball to the direction that you're wanting it. The other way in which we're going to show you is to close this on to the, to the ball. Close the coupler down onto the ball and depending on if you have someone to help, they could come back here and help hold some of the chains up because we're gonna actually get in the, uh, the tow vehicle and pull up and forward and to a certain direction in order to turn it because what we're turning is this mount and this housing. And we've got to turn it back to the same direction we were when we disconnected, which is slightly to the, to the left of us. Right. The next thing we'll wanna do is definitely go ahead and raise our jack. Raising the jack lowers the camper back down onto the ball in the tow vehicle. Now I'm not gonna raise it all the way up because I'm barely going to move and turn slightly to the left. Uh, and then that way we'll be able to see how that housing rotates. So what I did was uh, just simply made a very sharp turn to the left as I pulled up, put the tow vehicle back in about the same spot it was in when we had originally disconnected. So what that has done is turn this pin directly straight line across the coupler here, which will make it a lot easier to hook this triangle plate back up. So let's go ahead and do that now. Again, we're just raising it up to bring the weight off of the tow vehicle, which will give us a little bit more slack in our chains to make it easier to connect. And once you have the triangle plate on, we'll want to go ahead and put the pin in. Now I do recommend a small mallet dead blow. It does make it a little easier to put the pin back in. Sometimes it can be a little tight if it's not perfectly lined up. But once we have the triangle plate hooked back up, then we'd simply lower the camper back onto the tow vehicle. That'll give us the tension in our Anderson chains. And the last thing we'd want to do is just go ahead and reconnect our safety chains, our breakaway, and our seven pin. And don't forget your little safety pin for the coupler and once your jack is fully retracted you're ready to go let's take a look at the Anderson chains now you'll see some tension now that we've lowered the camper back on the tow vehicle 
the more tension you have, the more weight distribution it'll apply across the tow vehicle. And of course, each chain kind of works against the other in order to, to have the anti-sway feature. But let's take a look at tightening up these chains in case you want to apply a little bit more weight distribution to the tow vehicle. Now, the easiest way to do that is we're gonna go ahead and raise the, the camper back off the tow vehicle, giving us a little bit of slack in the chains, and that makes it a little bit easier to tighten it. Now you don't want to go too far with it, we just want a little bit of uh, slack in the chains as you can see. Now we're going to crawl up underneath the camper so that we can tighten each side. Here under the camper we're looking at the A-frame section. And of course this big section here is our straight tongue that comes through the, the center. Uh, the Anderson brackets are actually installed here uh, in the A-frame section, not on the complete outside, but just inside in the center supports. So what we want to do in order to tighten these chains up a little bit to give a little bit more weight distribution, we'll take the socket that is supplied with the Anderson kit and come under here, tighten it up just a bit. Now you'll want to count the uh, threads that you have on one side to the other to try to match them as close as possible. But once you've tightened both sides up, we'll go ahead and drop the weight back on the tow vehicle and see if it is the weight that we're, we're wanting. If not, we just come back here and start the process over again to tighten it up just a little bit more. Now that we've tightened our chains, we're going to go ahead and drop the camper back on the tow vehicle to check and see what our tension is with the weight added. Once we've dropped it down, the tension has been added back to those chains. And of course, this time we could take a look at the tow vehicle to see if some of that weight distribution has been applied across the front end. And if not, we could simply just raise the camper back up and go ahead and tighten it just a little bit more until we get it exactly where we think it needs to be.